uh, an awful lot of you, perhaps in this room here, are going to be terribly keen moodlers and technicians and practitioners, and often you'll find yourself working in an organization where you're frustrated because you can't get anything done. Um, though when you go and see an organization where things are driven by the senior management, you realize, wow, that's where they make big strides. And Frank is one of those people, and he comes, he, he is a principal of one of those colleges. And uh, I'm delighted to say that he's coming along uh, not just as a principal of City and Islington College, but he's also the chair of the 157 group of colleges, which is like the Russell group of uh, universities. Um, and, uh, 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 and they're really leading the way in terms of uh, the development and application of e-learning within their organizations. And he's come this afternoon to share some of his thoughts. So please give a warm welcome to Frank McLaughlin. It's always very tricky when someone gives you a big build-up as to whether you're going to meet up. Um, th that categorization was very interesting, Phil. I'm not quite sure where I would have stood up. Um, I might possibly have stood up as a teacher. Um, it reminded me, actually, um, Ralph Miliband, the father of uh, these Miliband boys, um, taught me politics at Leeds University in the 70s, and he described a similar situation where, after the revolution in Cuba, Castro said to the gathered group of people, he said, we need an economist to run the bank. And Che Guevara put his hand up and he said, and Castro said, I didn't know you were an economist, Che. And he said, sorry, I thought you said a communist. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, so um, I wanted to talk about culture. Um, Phil, Phil says that Phil worked at the college uh, many years ago. Well, so you worked with while you were still sitting in Islington, Phil, I think, didn't you? Um, and certainly before that. Um, and it's kind of, for me, a, what I want to describe is a journey here, my journey through education, um, and frankly, how much it's transformed. I wasn't sure that it was ever going to be completely transformed. Um, I was saying to a couple of people outside, sociologists often talk about takeoff when something's ready for the point of takeoff. Um, I don't think we've got an entire paradigm shift here, but I think we've certainly got takeoff. And I think we've been waiting for a takeoff for a very long time in the further education sector. The other thing, of course, for further and higher education, which I think is where nearly everybody's here is from, we're just about to go into an enforced period of change, which will make sure which will, our sectors will look very different um, four, five, two years down the road. Um, and it's, it's funding that will shift a lot of that. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So I just wanted to go back to 1993 which was when the further education sector was incorporated, when we were cut away from local authorities. And actually, it has been a fantastic... Actually, without getting to stand up, how many people are FE people here? Well, so, 35, 40%. Um, it is a transformed sector. I think by any measure, and I'll come on and demonstrate that, and I'm using my college really not just to kind of brag about the college, in truth, I think you could replace City and Islington College with an awful lot of colleges in the piece that I'm doing here, which is about that transformation. Anyway, 1993, some of you may know, there was an audit commission report which says um, the levels of non-completion in the FE sector are a substantial waste of national resource. Um, and, and in fact, at that time, there were considerations among policymakers about whether they could get rid of this sector, whether it could just be written out entirely. Um, it wasn't understood. Politicians and policymakers certainly didn't send their children through it. They didn't understand what it did, and this, re this commission report said um, it looked like a, a substantial waste of money. Actually, the, the, the really intricacies of the funding methodology, which some of you will know, was a result of this. The funding methodology was directly, in a kind of a, a behaviourist sense, to try and get the sector to change its behaviour by dropping money down slots to see if we would jump up and catch them, which frankly is how we've had to survive. Um, so then moving on to now, um, again, we're not unusual here. Success rate, for those of you from higher education who don't know it, success rate is the retention rate multiplied out by the pass rate. 
And I remember when I was in the senior management team post in corporation, I devised a measure for the college. It didn't exist then. The term success rate didn't exist. And I remember at that time thinking if we could get to 64%, 80% retention, 80% achievement, it would be a fantastic achievement for our college. Recognising, going back to the first slide, that retention rate, you know, the dropout rate in FE was around 35 40% in 1993. Interestingly, Times Higher Readers among you will know, there was an article a couple of weeks ago about American community colleges, and again, I know them very well, often lauded as examples to us, and the retention rates in American community colleges is about 60%. Um, so we are now, as a college, the 0910 data, on around 80%, 81% for young people. So even I can do that maths, around 90% retention, 90% achievement. And actually, by any measure, anywhere, compare that to secondary school achievement, compare that to, to large parts of higher education, that's a fantastic achievement. Also for us, um, again, colleges not often lauded in Ofsted. Um, we were inspected in 2008 and got grade ones across the board, frankly and correctly, because of the success rates. You know, if, you, if success rates aren't right, if the students aren't achieving, you can't and shouldn't be able um, to receive outstanding grades. This doesn't go on this bragging for very long. Queen's Anniversary Prize. Um, we received the Queen's Anniversary Prize twice. Again, if you haven't done it, few, actually not as many colleges, universities really know about the Queen's Anniversary Prize and put on a huge amount of efforts into winning it. Colleges, not enough of them step up to the plate. It has lots of rewards attached to it. Um, we were awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize for the second time in 2007-8 for our work in STEM. And actually our work in STEM has been fantastic for the college. It's really part of the thing that's put the college on, on the national map. Um, something about how the, the size of the college, you know, m like most FE colleges, thousands of part-time students, 10,000 plus, God knows how many there'll be next year and the year after around um, 5,500, 6,000 full-time students of around 4,000 of whom are 16 to 18 year old. Gender split, 70% of our full-time students are black and ethnic minority students, and 65% of our students currently receive the EMA, and almost all of those receive the maximum amount. Um, so the removal of the EMA from the college, from my college, got, we just don't know the impact. And actually, for me, EMA is, I won't go on about EMA for too long, EMA isn't about whether the students will come. I suspect the students will continue to come to colleges. It's whether they will be able to stay and fully participate. So what EMA allowed working class kids from poor backgrounds to do was to participate in education in a way that middle class kids don't need to worry about. In other words, they could get stuff paid for, they could have their lunches paid for, they could buy books and so on. Once that's removed from them, they're back into a very parlous state, I think, in terms of their ability to stay in college and you know, not be dragged away by jobs, coming to college every day, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I think it's extremely narrow-minded to have taken away the EMA. It's, it's transformed um, retention, and the retention in particular in, in my own college and in all colleges. And also, I think, a wonderful boast. Um, in 1991... Actually, I had an old friend come over from Ireland this weekend um, who worked in, in the college back in 1990-91. We sent around 150 students to university at that time. Um, and this September, last September, we sent 1,200 students to higher education. And again, everyone knows about the academic routes, and we've got a sixth form college as part of the college. But actually, the majority of our students came from non-academic route, came from vocational qualifications, came from access courses. Um, and again, the access courses in particular, as you know, turn around an adult's life in nine months. From having no level three qualification to going off to university, all sorts of universities to do wonderful qualification. Again, under very real threat from 2012. From 2012, I don't know if HE colleagues know this, from 2012, adults over the age of 24 will have to take out a loan to do that access course. It's not funded. Um, and I mentioned this to a vice chancellor of a university this week who didn't know it, who said, I'd better go back and look at my strategic plan. Because the strategic plan included significant growth in access students coming to the university. 
I think we've got a big question mark about how many access students we'll have post-2012 when you're saying not only do you have to pay your three years fees at HE, you've now got to pay them to do um, your, access, uh, your access course and take out a loan for that. Now, many of you will have seen this slide, so back onto my part about the course. So, that, that's, so that's about the journey. So the journey for the college in the last 17, 18 years. And now I want to say something about my take on education. As many of you will have seen this um, picture. I think it's from an Arabic university, possibly in southern Spain, possibly in the, it's certainly in the 14th century. It's 13 something. Um, and it's a, a um, looks a little bit like this actually. So, so somebody standing at the front talking to people in rows. You can see this guy, actually I haven't got a point, you see this guy at the back is asleep. I don't think quite yet, maybe give me another 20 minutes, we might have a couple at the back of here. Um, and the point about that is, that's largely what many of us experienced in education. This was my classroom, pretty much, not actually it, but pretty much exactly the classroom that I um, was a kid in the, in the early 1960s. Um, and it doesn't look much different a robed person at the front. Um, the difference from me, I don't want to offend anyone here, this person had an extremely long ruler and would smack you in any part of your body if you weren't learning in the way that they expected you to. Um, and actually my reflections on that thinking for today about the focus on teaching and learning in particular, this was all about teaching. And I can still, and actually, my, my Donald Clark, who some of you may know, say that the lecture is finished. Actually, I don't think that, I think the lecture certainly has its place. In, in a group like this, which is kind of self-selected, you've largely chosen to be here, and pretty much at a standard, then I think the lecture can work. The issue with this kind of classroom setup is, it's not selected. Those kids are there by virtue of their um, birth dates, and they're at totally different levels. And actually, it's, I just had a, a memory came back to me. Some of the older people in the group will remember how we learned to read was through these, well, how I learned to read, was these books called Janet and John. Um, anyone remember Janet and John books? A few nods around the place. I can still remember the anxiety that all the girls seemed to be on the pink Janet and John book three, and I was still on the Janet and John book one and couldn't see any possible way of getting to Janet and John book three. Um, and then at that point thinking, this isn't, I remember as a you know, five-year-old child thinking, I hate this. this, I just feel anxious going into the classroom, that kind of sense of anxiety with somebody pitching. And of course, the teachers talked to the, the kids who were the brightest kids. So the rest of us, I wasn't particularly bright. Um, the rest of us kind of struggled along um, in that way. So in terms of then when I came in, you know, I had a very interesting route. I left school at 15, did all sorts of odds and sods of things, and eventually went to university um, in my early 20s. And I came into the sector in 1979, and which, actually, I, I said probably the, the, the year of biggest change. I think we may be seeing a bigger change here. I think this is the most um, ideologically driven government we've seen, probably more, actually, than the Thatcher government, because on one level, they've thought things through further. Doesn't mean they've necessarily implemented them as well as they might want to, but they've thought them through. Um, so, 79, those of you can remember um, where we were, and certainly, and actually, FE was nowhere in this. I actually went back and got somebody to do a bit of digging around. So, if you look at educational policy papers, um, I mean, the, the, the positive side about now is FE is written into the educational um, story at the moment. Back in 79, you've got very, very few references to the college sector as being part of. It was some think it was um, a model picking up underachievement over here, but it wasn't written into the heart of educational policy. However, I came across one of these things, um, which was a banda machine. And I do remember thinking, you know, I thought about a bit of technology, and I remember thinking this was a wonderful device. I think it's called a spirit copier. Where if you, again, for those of you old enough to remember, you wrote on a kind of a carbony type sheet and you stuck it through here. Um, and I remember this seemed to me to be the kind of zenith of achievement. The other characteristic of my early days in teaching was this one. And I think that's still true in large parts of higher education and actually in, in parts of education all over the world. The classroom was my domain. Nobody entered that classroom. Um, and I mean literally. I can remember heads of departments coming into the classroom and I'd stop teaching and say, what do you want? 
um, and um, all the viewing panels were, were blocked up. Um, so there was, and for me, it was a very defensive thing. This is what I'm doing. What's that possibly got to do with you? There was no sense that somebody might be able to support me in the practice that I had in the classroom. And just hold that, because I think that's the key shift here. Um, and I know there's still some resistance to lesson observation in parts of the further education sector, but I'd say that lesson observation has been a key part of supporting teachers to become good and better, um, and, support, and individuals supporting each other. Um, so if we do a very quick leap forward then to 1993, when the colleges were incorporated, cut away from our local, uh, the local authorities. Um, in our case, we had two hits. The ILEA was um, taken apart, and we were for a very brief period part of Islington Council, and then Islington Council got taken apart. And actually, although that seems a very long time ago on one level, it doesn't seem to me very long ago that Clinton was first elected president. That was 93. Also, 93 was Maastricht implementation. So the EU as we now know it, and the much younger looking John Major. And what had shifted then in that 10, 12, 13 years from when I first became a lecturer? Well, I think that was the thing that had largely shifted, the photocopier. Um, and in terms of the technology, it was just seemed, and actually, frankly, photocopying is still a huge issue in most of our organizations, access to it, costs of it. Um, and the photocopier was really significant, I think. Um, and the whiteboard, not electronic at that point. But computers were, I, I do remember going on a computing course um, and actually just not being able to get my head around it um, at all. But then in 1994 or 5, I attended a conference like this, and somebody up the front to, at a lecture put this MIT slide up that some of you will know, which is about the stages of transformation. I think it was about 94, 95. So localized, coordinated, transformative, embedded, and innovative. Um, and if I put the next one up, You can see what that meant. And I remember looking at this and saying, at very best, our college, City and Islington College, had some localized exploitation of IT. I now, as a senior manager, had a PC on my desk. I had, no, actually it actually wasn't on my desk. It was to the left-hand side of my desk. I had absolutely no idea what to do with it. Um, somebody showed me that you could play solitaire on it. I wasn't particularly interested in that. Um, we didn't, unlike HE, we didn't have email. Um, and actually somebody came back in uh, 95 from a placement here at the university where they were using email and said, I remember saying to me, he said, this is going to change how we work. And I thought, I couldn't see the impact of that at all. So very localized. How we would ever get to innovative, if you look at the previous time scale, the middle of the 14th century through to the middle of the 20th century, frankly, not much had shifted. Here suddenly, in 17 years, I think things are genuinely transformed. So internal integration, frankly, we got that fairly quickly. Um, business process redesign, I'll come on to. It was absolutely clear that the business processes were um, redesigned and changed and are changed forever much more quickly than pedagogy in the whole process of teaching and learning. Um, and actually, on one level, that was about demonstrating on a, retur a return on investment. We were paying, I think in 1995, I know, not think, I know, because I was responsible for the budget, 2,560 pounds for a PC. So it was a huge investment to pay that much money for a piece of kit. And the finance people said, where's our return? We can't see any return on this level of investment, and yet people keep saying they want more and more of it. Why do you want more and more of it? demonstrate some kind of research. And it was right to ask that question, actually. So I think we fairly quickly began to demonstrate how we could get the return on the business side. Just going on to these last two stages, um, business network redesign, and then I think we really are, and conferences like this, I think, are about business scope redefinition. Two years ago, I would have said we weren't there. I think we are now really looking at how our businesses operate, the core business, the business around teaching and learning, looking at fundamentally how that works. Um, so on the transformation of business systems, and I think the, the, the changes, and actually I used to come to these kinds, I was trying to think of them, was it called NILTA? 
Um, and anyone remember NILTA? I think this is, still exists. Um, but I remember NILTA conferences. Um, it was a very minority activity around ILT in, in education. But on the business side, you know, online application enrollment, you know, again, HE got there before FE, UCAS in a single stroke went there, um, e-timetabling, e-registers, incredibly useful for us. Actually, e-registers, I would suggest, were the backbone of driving the e-learning. Because the e-registers we had to have in place to pay the EMAs. So when you're paying EMAs to more than 3,000 young people, you have to have a way, because it's, it's based on their attendance in college and their punctuality, you've got to have a way of measuring it. For understandable reasons, possibly, when it was paper-based registers, they were being fiddled. Um, and staff found it very difficult, and it's very difficult, to say that student was late twice this week, they don't get their 30 quid. Um, so electronic registers, I think, electronic registers meant that we could track the students. We could look at patterns of attendance, we could see where students were and weren't attending through weeks and courses in order to put some support in to, to help them be, um, better attend. MIS information online and in real time, again, critically important, particularly as we go into this next phase of life in FE, where people will tell you in government that they've made funding much more simple. Funding has become unbelievably complicated from next year for our, for our adult cohort in particular. Um, HR online, um, self-service, e-management reporting and performance. Um, we've got different ways of looking at how we operate as a business. So finance, online payments, e-tills, e-procurements, and then obviously the electronic communication, which is at the heart of how we all work now, um, which again is impossible to believe. From those early days of the late 80s where people had those brick-shaped um, mobile phones through to what all of us are carrying in our pockets now is um, an incredible transformation. So, this is at the heart of what I want to say. That actually it isn't ultimately about E anything or Moodle anything, it's about teaching and learning. And I think when we will have really had the transformation is actually when we stop having conferences like this on one level. When we actually just get back to the heart of talking about what does good teaching and learning look like and how do we facilitate it. And this was, and actually very few governments have paid any respect to this. This was um, a global report by McKinsey's um, uh, over three years report in 2007. It's called How the World's Best Performing Systems Are Out on Top. And it came back with a simple proposition. The quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And I think those teachers among us will know that that's absolutely the case. But actually, here we are again, as with the previous government, running for structural change rather than systemic change and supporting teachers. Um, and um, today's Education Guardian's also got a piece in it. I think three quarters of schools are now saying they're considering being an academy. I'm, I'm not making a political point about that. Not, not because they think that will improve at all the outcomes for their students, but because they think that's a better way to access resources, but they're very concerned about what the structural implications are. So I think the key to good and effective learning has to be based around the teacher. And actually somebody said to me as I came in, that what's been really good about today is that the learner, the student, is at the center of, of the conversations. And one of my jobs, I suppose, as the principal of the college is to try and make some coherence of this for, for everybody who, who sits with us. So this is um, a little diagram I've got to, to show how I oversee that process, how we, the senior managers, all the, the, the staff of the college. Now, you'll get people who trip out this stuff about, you know, the values sit at the heart of our organisation. I absolutely believe that the values sit at the heart of what we do. Um, and I'll come on to explain why. And actually those values came from an extended piece of work we did with all the staff of the college, which was asking them, not what, va what do you value, but what do you think this is about? What is this job you're in? What is this further education college about? And the stuff that came out of that was very interesting. It was very much about equality for our staff working in the inner city. Um, most, of, most of whom work in an FE college is about a vocation to try and help people transform their lives. 
it was about diversity, it was about learning. I was delighted to see it was other words like aspiration and excellence, but at the heart of it also, which is written into our value statement, was social justice, that people felt for the FE sector in particular, what we do at the heart of it is something around social justice. So that kind of gives um, form to where we're trying to go as an organization. But where we're moving over three or four years, and, I absolutely, and this is where I spend most of my time, is trying to communicate where I see the future for the college, because we're, all of our staff are professional staff. You know, virtually everybody who works in my organization, including 80% of our security guards, are graduates. Um, and that's something to do with the London economy and where people work. So this isn't a type of organization, and I suspect none of you work in one, where if somebody says jump, nobody says how high. People say, why on earth should I jump? And I think that's absolutely right. Um, so it's about engaging people with what we're trying to do. And if we can't do that, if we can't engage the staff with what we're trying to do, then I think we're on a hiding to nothing, really. Because they won't put in that bit, which you know makes the difference. The difference is the extra discretionary effort that our staff will put in for our students. If they don't do that, if they're just completely cynical about the whole thing, then it's actually it's terrible for the students, but frankly it's terrible for them. Um, you know, and I've moved on people, I don't mean sacked, I said to them that I think you really should think about getting a different job, working somewhere else, because you're rotting inside of the back of your cynicism. Um, and you can kind of, kind of see why people, but frankly, I'd say to you, if any of you are feeling that, get another job. Life's too short, really. You, know, you really need to think about trying to do something else and, and do somewhere else. It's going to get you eventually, um, and it will certainly get the people you work with. I, I won't go into any detail about this. So th this is about trying to get people signed up to say, we're trying to move the organization from here to here, and we're doing it for a very particular purpose, and that purpose is around our students. And if that sounds very holier than thou, well, kind of tough, really, because I think that really is what it's about. I think that's why FE is such an exciting place. I came into higher education through working. I was in, uh, working on building sites. I got involved in the trade union movement, and I did my A-levels in evening class in an FE college. And that's how I came in touch with FE. And for many of my staff, that's how they came there, and they recognize it for many of our students um, it's not their second chance, it's probably their only chance, really. And the way funding is at the moment, it's definitely their only chance. Um, because if you don't get it the first time round, there is a new mechanism of funding, which means they definitely will not fund you. So it's not just um, uh, second degrees in, in HE, I don't mean second degrees, I mean whatever that term is for another first degree. In, it works through for FE. Students will not be funded to do a level three course again or a level two course. So this is their second, for many of our students, and only chance. And what I would say about that is, although people are certainly not thrilled about the, the money they're paid and all the rest of that stuff, I would largely think that people are probably as happy working in City Innocent College as they could be anywhere, because there's that sense about we're turning the circle and we're making it work. So I think that's um, really important. Now, this doesn't look so good, actually, in the state that Arsenal are in at the moment. Um, but I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about coaching, because I think that's the bit we miss as teachers. You don't, you're not born a good teacher. And actually, I used to think I was a really good teacher. When I look back on it, I was actually fairly second rate, actually, because nobody saw me to tell me whether I was good or bad. So the notion that you would employ somebody and never see them do their job, to me, is bonkers. Not because you want to hold them to account or pin them up against the wall, but you want to help them to do it. Those of you who know anything about football, I used to be very heavily involved with Arsenal. Every position has got a coach. You know, Fabregas, one of the best midfield players in the world. Every position has got a coach to help that player become a better player. And I think at the heart of what we do, and I think that often it was in senior management they spoke about coaching. The key people that coach are the people working with the students. So you can see that from um, Wenger. I've been educating players since I was 25 and I know one rule. The first thing you do to develop a player is to put him with another good player. If you're a great player, you want to play with great players. And I think that's a key thing in teaching. Uh, my daughter's um, teaching in a, is in, in a NQT year, teaching in Leeds. And it's only the support of the other teachers that are getting her through it, really. It's really tough. 
teachers out there taking her aside, taking her for a drink in the evening, talking about the, the, the process, giving her some learning materials. And I think that's, so we need to systematically, systemically build that into the organization. So how have we done that over many years at, at the college? And again, some of you will have some of this, some of you have all of this, some of your organizations will have more than this. So I think the first one is to build a framework for reflection and dialogue. You know, again, when I look back on teaching, I did lots of griping, but I can't really remember too much sitting around really, you know, proper intellectual engagement with that process in the classroom. How difficult it is, how challenging it is, what tips you could get from other people. And that build that proper professional space around that. And actually, for me, then, if you do that stuff, all the E stuff comes naturally. Or well, someone said, you know, actually, years ago, one of the best resources I saw that brought it together was um, a rather cynical, I'm going to use that word again, rather, so a t an English literature teacher teaching Chaucer to a group of kids and had to teach Chaucer, it's part of the curriculum, kids hated it. Found um, a website from Stanford, I think, um, where it was on the whiteboard and when you ran your cursor along it, it spoke in Old English. And suddenly those learners could bring the kind of visual and auditory together and he could see it in the results. The results were transformed for students doing that Chaucer module. So that for me was one thing. If you've got that dialogue going on, that's where some of the um, supportive lesson observations, and I really mean that, that notion that lesson observation is a tool of management is just mad. It needs to be turned on its head. Lesson observation is a way about helping. And actually, that's one of the things in HE. You know, most people in HE aren't teachers. They're lecturers. They're not trained to be teachers. Um, and I think, and then frankly, I went to, actually, there's nobody here old enough. I went to uh, a specialist FE teacher training college, which was desperate when I looked back on it. Desperate. I didn't wasn't really taught me to do very little at all. Um, but done properly, rigorous teacher training, intellectually stretching, I think is critical. So lesson observation is part of that. Including peer and joint observation. So we've now got staff who just go into each other's classrooms as you get in the best places just to help each other. Self-assessment right the way through the organization. Now, not because Osted want it, but we know that is how you improve reflecting on your work, building that up to a curriculum area and a departmental level into a whole college report. Um, we don't call it a quality unit in the college, we call it a teaching and learning unit. Because actually, staff told me, and I must admit I kind of felt it myself, that just talking about quality was, somebody said, what does it mean, this quality thing that everyone's talking about, you know? Um, and I said, well, how about good teaching and learning? And they said, oh yeah, I know, I know what that's about. So we talk about teaching and learning. And, and talk about, for example, what does outstanding teaching and learning look like? What does an outstanding lesson look like? Um, so again, something that's accelerated over the last few years, the 157 group of colleges, just happens to be a cluster of colleges. What we do is share best practice on the curriculum, on all sorts of aspects of what we do. Um, if someone isn't doing so well in their lesson observation, what kicks in is not a punishment, but some coaching support. One-to-one -one coaching to help that teacher improve what they're doing. And I can't think of an instance where it hasn't worked, where we've had to kind of say, well, there's another pathway we've got to take. In every instance, putting that support in has improved the grades in that lesson observation and made that teacher a better teacher. You know, and all the stuff you then might know, um, learning styles, and we now, actually, we've got a workshop to colleagues from the college running a session tomorrow, picking up on what I'm saying here, and we now call that, not Elon, we call it e, we call that um, innovation, because it's about innovation in the round, not necessarily just the E bit, um, and then le learner feedback, which again, is um, critical to know what the people who are ultimately paying our salaries think about what we're doing. So this is where it gets a bit trickier for me now. Um, so in terms of that takeoff bit, the one that really shifted for me is, I couldn't see it really, there were loads of people spending loads of times uh, preparing learning objects. I chaired a national group, I was trying to remember this the other day actually, the NLN, I think it might have been called the, it was the NLN curriculum group, and we put millions of taxpayers' money Anyone here from the old NLN? OK, 
Okay, you carry on then. Um, we, we, <laughs> we, we put millions of pounds of taxpayers' money into producing wonderfully swishy learning objects, and God knows where they are. Um, teachers at the time told us, we can't use them. We can't adapt them. They don't work for us. So what shifted for me was, is when, when you've got the, the student portal. The student portal, which we call My Candy, and again, I think really does begin to shift the power dynamic. It puts the learner really center stage. Um, and for our learners, you know, and actually schools have done some really great work on this. I don't know, certainly my own daughter's experience at university, just having graduated a couple of years ago, um, was that there was very little in Leeds University that had changed from when I left there in, whenever I left there in the 70s. Um, sorry to anyone from Leeds here. Um, so, again, more detail on this tomorrow. So, um, link to Moodle there, um, personal space, the library stuff, all of this is fairly standard. This bit's important. Weekly attendance, punctuality. So you're then beginning to have a structured dialogue with the student about how they're doing. So in terms of their attendance and punctuality, um, and in terms of their assignments. So rather than you know, a personal tutorial, how's everything going? Great, off you go. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at the evidence base. And students going back to tutors to say, um, I think the next slide shows it better. So this is the, um, the ILP, this individual learning plan for the student, which again demonstrates a, a two-way dialogue between the member of the staff and the student about where they are. Because that seems to me to be the bit that where kids are getting through independent schools and others getting pushed on to get the best grades. Is somebody looking at and saying, if you just do a little bit more work there, you're going to push that grade from a B to an A or an A to an A star. Um, and that's what we should be doing for our young people and adult students in the FE sector. We should be in exactly the same way saying, if you just tweak these dials here, we can push this whole grade profile up um, and ensure that you really do hit the, 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 um, the admissions criteria of the next level course you're going to or the university or whatever. Um, this, apparently, is um, an activity on Moodle, and I think what it shows, um, I can read it just about here, it shows the big thick band is resources. So it shows you between 2006, 7 and 2010, 11, how that resource thing has gone up and down. Obviously, in 2008, 9, overwhelmingly for resources. I think the interesting bit here is the one, two, third, that purple wedge, which is going up, which shows the individual learning plan. So this is in the college sector where the individual learning plan is the place where, so rather than just going into a repository of uh, information of resources, it's how the individual learning plan is beginning to sit at the heart of what the students do. And I think you can see that, this is a similar depiction just from what the first for season in some college, still overwhelmingly ac accessing resources um, assignments, and I, I think we're saying, someone said 30 to 40% of our courses now are actively assessed through Moodle, so not just the resources there, but assessed through there, quizzes, and then the ILP beginning to grow up. And I think that's the bit for me, when we see the ILP, I suppose a bit like Facebook, if the ILP is the vehicle through which the student's going through to their course, you get the sense that they're actively using that to start manage, managing their own learning. Um, again, talking to a vice chancellor of university, actually very close to here, who went back uh, on the run up to this fees proposition and said, make the case to me for why your degree course you charge, the expectation was that every course in the college would anyway, make the case for why your degree course we should charge £9,000. What is it about your degree course and what standards would we set to people who are then paying £9,000 effectively out of their pocket. Um, and I think one of those was about returning work, about how quickly you return work. Okay, just the last couple of slides and then um, I've got a few minutes between you going to lie in the park, like the 50 or 60 people with these yellow things on who were lying in the park as I walked over from Russell Square, or, or go for a pint before your evening event. So, has it worked? Well, I, I think this is a, a wonderful boast 
the satisfaction levels of our students are unbelievably high. And it's not just that they've got low standards, which you could ask, is it because their expectations are poor? I think they've got very high expectations. Um, and actually, expectation is something that we talk about in our values. So you can see that there. And also, that our staff largely are on board, as you can see. 80% 80, 80 of staff agree that continuous improvement is part of the college culture. That's what we're about. Um, and that's where I can have common cause with staff. Um, although I am officially called the principal and chief executive of the organization, I don't use the chief executive bit. I'm the principal. I'm a teacher in background. And if I wanted to be a chief exec or just work in business, I'd have gone and done that. I um, actually did it for a number of years. This is about teaching and learning at the heart of what we do. And that's the common ground on which we have a dialogue with anyone in the organization. Finally, so these are just a few reflections. It's about culture. It's not about kids. It's about a culture of teaching and learning. And the key bit is really focusing in on learning. And I think in FE for too long, the focus was on what is a good teacher and what does good teaching look like without checking it back. You know, that classroom, uh, sorry, that question that inspectors ask, the primary question, is learning taking place? And how do you know? And actually, I could give you some, I'm sure we've all got anecdotes about going back to check learning with our students and realize that even in small groups, some of them are way off on understanding that. Um, give power away particularly to the learner, I really believe that. If we're going to prepare people for, uh, and that's where I've got real issues with things like the English baccalaureate and you know, this notion that uh, the education secretary said last week, um, boys or children in school should read 50 books a year. Well, actually, be, there wouldn't be very many people here standing up if we said, do you read 50 books a year? The notion that a 15-year-old boy in an inner city comprehensive school is reading, or any boy that I've ever met is reading uh, uh, 50, 50 books a year. Um, might be quite a few people here reading 50 comic books a year. I think no, no, the, um, the techies welcome that. Um, sorry, sorry, I couldn't help but say that. As soon as I know two of them are fanatical about them here. Um, must have a holistic high expectation uh, curriculum offer with parity. Now, we have, let's, let's make no boat, we have not got parity of esteem in our educational routes, and I think we're still some way away from it. Everything is still made with reference to the GCSE A level degree route. I don't know if it's good or bad actually. What we're unquestionably seeing is a rethink among our young people in the inner city about whether that paradigm can work for them. Under the, under the financial strictures into the future. And I can see you nodding, and we all know that's taking place. Um, students beginning to think, well, if I've got to pay 27,000 pounds of fees at university to have a very uncertain future, you know, that paradigm did work for a while, didn't it? We told everyone, I told my kids, look, go to university, you'll have a good time, you won't pay too much money, and you're, you're, you're better equipped in the job market at the end of it. Um, well, actually, now we're getting students coming back to say, well, if I did something like an HNC or HND, and it was work-related, and I was working with an employer while I'm doing it, and I'm working part-time, and then I've got a full-time job, and I've only got £8,000 worth of debt in total, you know, I, I, I absolutely believe that we're seeing a fundamental rethink of that. I'm not sure it's right for the economy, incidentally. Um, you know, again, you will have seen, we work very closely with London Met, uh, and London Met, and I know the senior people there very well, London Met have completely reshaped their offer into the future. Would that have happened without the financial strictures? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I certainly think there'll be fewer opportunities for our young people going from FE into HE in the future. I don't, I don't see more of them. Um, you've got to make, think about employability. What does employability look like? Um, particularly in the inner city, we've got adult students and young people. We've, we've got a third of adults in Islington um, are workless, and it's getting worse. That was in the boom time, that figure. We've got third generation unemployed young people. So it's not just their parents who haven't worked, it's their grandparents who haven't worked. So that notion about, you know, tell them something about work, nobody in their family, 40% of children in Islington are born in workless households. Nobody is getting up in the morning to go to work. So actually, that getting up and getting yourself to school or college is offering major achievement for those kids. They're often the first one getting out of bed in the morning and, and, and coming in to, uh, into college or work. 
And my real worry is that can only get worse as London needs more and more. There's no issue actually at, at, at really the top end of London employment. So the city doesn't have an issue. The city will tell you there's no, there's no, uh, there's no issue filling jobs. Um, but they're not being filled by Londoners often. They're being filled by people from across the world who are going into um, those high level jobs. So there is a real issue around employability and um, getting local people in, into jobs to secure their futures. So I think making the curriculum more work related um, is all essential. And then my final bit, and actually I'm pleased to say it looks very different. I remember speaking at a conference like this about six or seven years ago, and I would say it was 90% men. And no disrespect to age, I'm getting on myself. 90% of the men were over 45. So it's very different here to say. So I would say innovate, but um, beware of boys and girls with the toys. It's not, the toys help, but at the heart of it, it's about uh, teaching and learning. So that's me, thank you. I can take. Hello. What are you? Thanks very much, Frank. Um, a lot to think about. One thing that struck me, I must say, was that quote about education, the quality of education not exceeding the quality of the teachers. Um, and why is because I had a conversation with someone just before we came in, and they asked me the difference between UK, India, uh, in terms of education, because I go out there every year, have been doing for six years, working with universities out there, and still they think um, transformation is technology driven and it's not quality driven. And I think where you see a real difference in transformation is where it's about the quality uh, and raising standards in teaching and learning. And I think that, that said, spoke volumes there. So thanks very much, Frank. Before you go, is there anyone that would like to um, ask a question or comment? Yeah, um, we'll pick that up in a bit more detail tomorrow at the workshop that people are running. My, my sense of that, um, again, not scientifically, is that it's a shift, really. That the teachers have felt it to be um, a good and bad pressure, um, that they're, they're doing more, if you like. So they're not only managing what they're doing in the classroom, but they are actually managing the student, in the, help, helping to manage the student in the widest extent. But I think people are largely with it. And we, we've not got any kickback at all. People are recognizing that if there is a kind of a shift, again, I think a paradigm shift is too strong, but if there is a shift, that shift is towards a kind of a more empowered student taking more control of what they're doing. So, and I think staff, staff are overwhelming in support of that. At the back, Dominic. Well, I think what, what we have to do is, as an organisation, because you're right, it can mean much more for the teacher. You know, they're, they're, as I said, they're, they're orchestrating a much bigger thing than they were previously. So one way is to see if the technology can make parts of the job easier for them. And I'd say e-registers have certainly done that. So the notion that you walk into the classroom and the register's there on the machine and you just tick it through and it's done does save all that time of actually not only taking, getting the register, bringing it in, summing it up at the, at the week and term in. So that helps. So I think trying to find smart ways, ways to do it. I think one of the things we do pretty well in the college is asking staff what they think. Uh, so I know another area that's remembering from even my time of teaching was the whole exam regime stuff around vocational qualifications and the SRF forms for BTEC. Um, so we're again looking to see how we can make that simpler, bring it online, make it electronic. But I don't, I don't want to suggest there's any um, quick fix to that. We still have three training days a year. Um, we still try and stop the track 
Because I think that, you know, we may even be thinking about stopping the track more, actually, um, to give staff and students space to reflect. Um, I'm not saying the students are overtaught, they're not overtaught. So, so I think you've got to kind of structurally build it in, but we've got no simple answers. And actually, Phil, if that comes up at all, in one, one of the things I think is really useful about an event like this is where people have got really good ideas that can make immediate changes, if we can kind of spread them around the network. Because I think, again, we, we've all got the technology now to bring this stuff in quickly if we, if we can. If you, if you don't mind, I'll just add an idea to that because I know a few of you here shared with me an online course and ostensibly it was to learn Moodle 2 and look at the differences or the value added uh, to that of Moodle 1.9. But uh, Jim Judges, uh, I don't know if he's here today, is he, is he, oh there he is, he's around there, who took it, it, uh, it, it he made us create and design a course, and each of us went into the other's courses as students. And it was like uh, what you were saying, Frank, about lesson observation. We kind of think we're pretty good. And then we're always surprised when others come in and suggest that we may do it slightly differently. And I'm thinking, actually, Dominic, maybe one of the things that we need to think about is lesson observation, but online because this was a totally online course and it was absolutely fabulous. I really enjoyed it and part of why I enjoyed it so much was because I learned from Bob Newman and other teachers who were doing the course with me. So there's one idea that we could all use. Sorry, is there another question or comment? I was thinking when you were talking about transformation and the electronics and IT, how it's transformed business. And it appears to me that we haven't really transformed the education system at all. It's still very like it was 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Why should we have 300 universities delivering a similar course? Why should we have X number of FE colleges? Why can't individuals access online or other other electronic means, the best possible courses, and the staff of the colleges become, have much more time to act as coaches and mentors rather than just doing a basic delivery. You all heard that question. I mean, actually, frankly, that's the question that people have been asking ever since this stuff's been around. I suspect the answer is for the very reason you're choosing to sit here um, at this conference and not just do it online somewhere, you know, that I think people we thought, you know, Phoenix, you could argue that Phoenix University is doing it, that, you know, they've got tens of, and actually Phoenix, I didn't realise, are the, the same group as BPP who are running um, private uh, degrees in London now for £3,250 a year. I didn't realise that's the same as the Phoenix group. Um, I think it's going to shift. It, frankly, will have to shift. The finances will make it shift, and I think that's not quite a good enough reason to. Um, my take on that is that largely, whatever subject it is, people still want it to be blended. They want that, that, that notion. What we should be doing, however, is, you know better than I, all the evidence is that, not this particularly, but if it's real content that you're learning from a lecture, if you can access that and keep going back and relearning it, that's a much more effective way of learning than getting the one-off hit in the lecture theatre and then wondering. So I think what we've got to do is build in the best of what we've got to then allow, uh, allow our, our students to, as you said, to be coached and supported. Um, I'd, I'd be very interested in other people's views on that, Phil. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the stock answer is blended learning, isn't it, that people want to come and do it. Um, but we certainly have to um, rethink how we're looking at our delivery for adult students as we go um, in, into the next couple of years, because frankly, for large swathes, there's going to be no funding. Mm. So we either say, we are just a business and tough. You know, if we were just a business, I would be advising my governing body that we should get out of this adult business. Because this adult education is bad business, um, if it were just a business. But we're not just a business. You know, this is about our communities and how we support our communities. So we've got to find new ways. But the model, so for example, the access model has to, sh has to be changed now. And actually, that might be one, Jane, that we might want to think about. My head of teaching learning units here. Um, I can't see how we're going to have anything other than a 30% hit on access participation over the next three years in my college. We're one of the biggest access providers in the country. 
Now, that's going to hit on to HE people here as well. Unless we find a really radically different way. And the other thing is, as you know, lots of students who are eligible to come off their benefits, a so-called active benefit, job seekers allowance, they can come to college. But you will also know, those of you in FE, that students now on active benefit are being hounded off of those benefits in a way that they've never been before. So actually, again, as a business, you'll not be very well advised to take a student on an access course who's on job seekers allowance because as sure as eggs are eggs, they're going to be hounded off of that job seekers allowance by the Christmas of the first term, and you've got a student who's... So we've got to find new models. I think it's, a, it's not a great way to be there, but that's what we're going to have to do over the next couple of years. Then, no one of us, no one college, however big we are, can make the investment we need to support that volume of students. That's why we are working together, consortiums of colleges nationally and in London. So, for example, on the access to humanities side, if we've got some great work that's lectured, why not share the lectures with everyone? You know? And I think we're beginning to, to realise that as we kind of sort stuff out over the next couple of years, we'd be better to say, rather than all competing on courses that we know we can't fill, let's see if people can specialise in some areas. Um, you know, we, we've got... Um, the, the skills funding agency tell us we've got a potential 25% risk on our funding oh, 25, uh, in next year. Um, so however smart we are, um, and actually at the end of the day, that student's not coming to college. That's them not changing their lives. Mm. Right. And talking of end of the day, yep. <laughs> now, uh, can we uh, give Frank a great round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And of course, uh, we can pick up on a lot of this discussion tomorrow. Um, so we'll see you later tonight, or if not, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.